Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joe Nickram. I am the Vice President of Communications at the FSMB, and it is my privilege to moderate our session this afternoon on how state medical boards can communicate more effectively with their licensees. Among the most important audiences that state medical boards communicate with are their own licensees, busy healthy profession health professionals who are often hard-pressed for time and may be overwhelmed by messages and information they receive from multiple organizations. Cutting through the clutter is vital when communicating with licensees, especially when it comes, uh, comes to information about key policies, regulations, and deadlines. Today, we have an excellent panel of communicators from state medical boards to offer insights on their best practices and share innovations that can help regulators become more effective in managing their communications with internal audiences. I will now introduce our distinguished panel. Jimmy Bush is Director of Quality and Engagement for the Washington Medical Commission. In this role, she leads a team that evaluates and modernizes processes and procedures through six Sigma Lean tools, paperless workflows, and employee training. She is responsible for developing, tracking, and holding business units accountable for their quantitative and qualitative performance. Ms. Bush also plays a major role in the outward-facing communications of the commission. She's developed communication strategies for Twitter and Facebook that center around providing unique content for the distinctive demographics of each platform and has been driving the force behind the Commission's annual conference and Speakers Bureau. <clears throat> Jerrica Stewart is Communications Officer for the medical, State Medical Board of Ohio. In this role, she executes communication strategies, creates and distributes targeted emails, responds to needs in the Ohio Medical Marijuana Control Program, designs digital media campaigns, and serves as the media contact and spokesperson for the board. Ms. Stewart also facilitates the board's education and outreach, including the Partnership and Professionalism Program, which introduces Ohio medical students to the responsibilities of medical licensure. She's been instrumental in implementing its recent licensee campaigns, including raising visibility for its cultural competency, educational resources, sexual boundary violation videos, and the Ohio board's duty to report CME initiative. Carlos Villatoro is our public information manager for the Medical Board of California. In this role, he oversees the board's communication, marketing, and outreach efforts to his various stakeholders. Previously, Mr. Villatoro served as a senior public information officer for the California National Primate Research Center at UC Davis, where he promoted the center as a worldwide leader in non-human primate research. He also served as an information officer for the California Department of Public Health, where he led the state's communications efforts during the Disney measles outbreak, the passing of SB 277, the law that did away with the personal belief exemption for required school vaccines in California, and the emergence of the Zika virus. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here with us, and we'll start with Jimmy. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I am Jimmy Bush. I am the Director of Quality Engagement, um, and as your program mentions, we're going to be discussing our strategies for engagement and communication with you this afternoon. And I'm going to be kicking things off by giving you a foundational look at communication strategies, channels, and goals. Now, first off, we have to talk about the who. And unless your audience is completely homogeneous, your communication strategy needs to divide your, your stakeholders into useful segments, and then sub-segments if necessary. Um, this will allow you to tailor, tailor your messaging toward them. Now, at the WMC, our high-level audience are clinicians and patients. Now, that's not a helpful distinction because at some point, that covers all of Washington residents, right? So we have to look at creating these sub-segments where we can um, drill down into basically anyone who touches healthcare and, and drill down on their needs. So we've done this with our clinicians by deciding are, uh, where do they work? Are they in a large organization, a hospital, private practice, etc.? We can drill down further between the clinician and the patient by uh, finding out their location. It, maybe they live in a county where they have unique needs as opposed to a big city. Um, and then age. Now, we don't look at age in terms of a 40-year-old you know, female. We look at age in more of a general term. Where are you in your career? Are you a student? Are you a professional? Are you a seasoned professional? And try and um, target the, uh, the messaging toward them. Now, um, just as a FYI, other categories you could consider, we don't, but based on your organizational needs, you might need to target donors, beneficiaries, um, alumni, investors. You can even sometimes break it down by profession. 
So if you want to target a specific specialty, or maybe you have a legislator uh, community that you want to talk to, or teachers, you know, that everything can basically be uh, sub-segmented down uh, so that that messaging is, is targeted to those needs. Now, the next thing we have to talk about is the why. So how does your organization define success? The success of your communication strategy lies in answering the why are you communicating with these people. What we did was we took our um, overall strategic core values and then we translated those into uh, specific communication strategies. So our core values are on the left hand side, we translated those into communication strategies. And this really centers on being mindful about how and why we are sending these messages. With email messaging, we don't want to bombard them with message after message and, have, and end up with that email fatigue. So we're really just trying to be mindful where are they in their journey. Now, the trickiest part of any communication strategy is to decide what you need to say to your audience. You need to be sensitive to who they are, their needs, and again, where they are on their journey with you. So as we began our communication strategy at the WMC, we mapped out our stakeholders' main interactions. You may also know this as touch points um, with the WMC during their full customer journey. And then we wrote down what we want their experience to be at that point. So on this slide, we just have two ends of the spectrum. Are you a licensee? Are you uh, a member of the public? And what can we offer you in terms of messaging on either side of the spectrum? And you can see on the license-focused communications, we have applications. And our goal is to make that easy to find and use. Now, this is just an example in terms of as you start crafting a communication um, strategy. This is a very simple map to write out, but it kind of saves a lot of time and provides you that direction you may need. So and then the final question is how to best communicate your message. Ask yourself which channels will give you the best uh, opportunity to speak to your audience. And to do this, it helps to have a good idea of what's available to you. Your choice of channel will depend on where your audience can be reached. For example, if you're targeting teens, you'll likely have a better shot at reaching them via influencers than with radio ads. And the other thing to think about is what resources you have available. So if you're a little limited on resources, not all of these options may be uh, for you. But you know, think about, do you have copywriters to write blog posts and social media content? Can you budget for targeted online ads? All of that will be important to kind of consider as you're crafting this journey. Now, the information here can be scaled based on the resources you do have available. And these aren't all of the options. These are just some of the more popular ones, where the horizontal axis will show how much it costs, and the vertical axis shows the technological barriers to, uh, to get into that channel. Now, um, I've created this slide with the costs, assuming that all of your variables are being held constant. But this will all um, obviously change based on where you're targeting your engagement. So for example, in LA, it's probably cheaper to build a website than it is to buy TV ads. But that might not be the same for an audience in Yuma. So just kind of consider where you are and who you're targeting. Um, and you know, not all of these platforms or strategies are going to be right for you. And the list of engagement options you can use for your organization goes way beyond what's listed on this slide. Um, I just want you to understand your audience, the options to engage with them, and how to use these channels. Now, if you look in the lower left quadrant here, this is where your social media channels will land. They're res um, relatively easy to use and inexpensive. However, the cost can be scaled based on your targeted messaging strategy. And I just want to quickly go over that um, before we move on. So Facebook, while you may not need to be on every social media channel, it's worth in, um, investing in a Facebook page. The platform has more than a billion daily users and integrates with a lot of other applications easily. Um, LinkedIn provides an opportunity to engage by creating a company page. This is business-oriented and networking. 
Uh, Twitter has a bit of a volatile history. Uh, it rises and falls in favor rather quickly. Um, if you've been watching the news. But this is a great place to let your organization's personality shine. This is where you come to have fun with your, with your, um, your network. And then after Google, YouTube is the internet's second largest search engine. So if you publish videos there, it gives you a great opportunity to engage with your, your audience. But what I'm gonna be talking to you most about today is engagement via a website and search engine optimization. So we are under the umbrella of the Washington State Department of Health. This is a very large state agency um, with over half a million licensees. And as part of being under that umbrella, we were just getting lost in the website shuffle. We are semi-autonomous. And so we just said, well, it makes most sense for us to create our own website. To do this, we contracted with a outside um, marketing agency. They helped us with a rebrand that was more focused on our voice as the Washington Medical Commission rather than overall DOH. Um, and with that rebranding, then we were able to start moving toward the website. And before I go on, I want to draw your attention to using focus groups. Now, um, we contracted with the outside marketing agent to do this, and I, I cannot stress how helpful that was in the long run. Um, this, this might sound insurmountable for your organization, but I do not recommend that you attempt to run a focus group by yourself. Um, leave it to your contractor to conduct and present the results, because really if you attempt this from an internal perspective, you run in, into that forest for the trees problem where features and information that may seem clear and understandable to you are not perceived that way to an outside party. So having that focus group saved us a lot of time and frustration on the back end. Um, and I cannot tell you how much it's helped. But as we move forward, w the reason this is an engagement channel is because a website acts as the foundation for all of your other engagement channels. A website is going to drive your audience to a central place to learn more about you and your offerings. And websites attract a cross-section of an organization's audience, where some channels, for example, like influencers, radio ads, and sponsorships are likely to be highly specific um, in terms of audience and segments. A website is a widely uh, uh, acceptable place for anyone in their journey. So a website is also viewed as the core of an organization's online presence, and it really is one of the greatest initial investments you can make in your organization. And just to put this into perspective, we went from what's on the left to on the right, from beginning to end, focus groups and all. The initial cost of it costs less than one year of printing and mailing our quarterly newsletter. So it really is an investment that you can scale, and it's one of the greatest you'll ever make. So websites let you speak to the needs of a wide variety of people simultaneously. And through kind of smart and intentional design, you can make your website accessible to whoever they are on their journey. Um, websites are interactive. So if you want to know, if you are looking for something based on who you are, we've created a website that lets you take that path. If you have a specific task in mind, like you want to file a complaint, look up a doctor, look up a policy, that's another way you can navigate the website. Um, and a website is just unique from other channels in that people can craft their own journeys and interactively explore your offerings at their own pace. And just in general, websites are more evergreen than some of the other offerings we can have. Now I'm going to quickly go through some website analytics. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts of having our own website. Don't worry about reading all of this. This is just to show you a website any, any website you have can have an analytics page or a dashboard or a landing page, whatever the term might be uh, that might be used. So I'm just going to give you a high-level look at some of the demographics that we collect. So if you drill into our unique page views, we can tell what pages are being viewed the most. And obviously, our home page and search feature are high targets. But we know that 32% of our website traffic is due to licensing inquiries. So what we try and do is create a focus on those areas and make sure we're creating a path that is easy um, to use and find for the user. 
especially during busy season when people are graduating medical school and applying for a Washington license for the first time, we want to make sure that initial touch with us is as easy as possible. And then just some more data, user acquisition drills into how people are finding us. Uh, search includes all search engines. Direct is when people type into their browser wmc.wa.gov. Referral, referral is a link from another website like FSMB and social is social media. Um, this helps you look at where you're generating a lot of traffic and focus your efforts. Um, if your resources are limited, you can kind of see where you're getting the most traction and adjust as needed. Sessions by country is just a simple look at where people are coming from. We can further break this down into language. So, for example, in Canada, I know who's speaking English versus who's speaking French. Um, India, same thing, English versus Hindi. This is important to know if you ever find yourself in need of translating um, websites or materials. You can see who's been coming to your website and which language will have the biggest impact. So then, just more data for you. Uh, we can break it down by age, gender. Um, we can also break it down by other things they're searching. So if they're also looking for sports, healthcare, food, travel, we can break it down and see other things that might, we might be able to connect with them. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. Your data becomes more accurate the longer your website is up and running. Um, take demographics with a grain of salt. If someone's using an alter ego on their search page, that is what will get reported to you, not what's actually on their driver's license. Um, so it's kind of a, a place to jump off, but um, it's probably not the end all be all. Um, and lastly, we just know what device people are using, which is important for a website layout. If a lot of people are visiting your website via cell phone, you need to design a website that's used for mobile devices and smaller screens. We can look at users by uh, time of day, new visitors, returning visitors. There's really a lot of ways to slice this um, based on your questions. Now, this is important for a bunch of reasons, which I'm going to quickly go to uh, just for the sake of time, in terms of search engine optimization. Now, all of that data that I collected is now going to be put into an algorithm on my preferred search engine is Google. They have nothing to do with this presentation. It's just what we're using. Um, this is also called targeted marketing. Uh, and basically to do this, you create a library of search terms. We did this by asking our staff and commissioners to describe the work that they do. And we put that into a library. This tends to be technical in nature. Um, but we also asked our focus groups to, you know, when we say Washington Medical Commission, what does that make you feel? We also put that into the search um, library. And lastly, we took the words from our complaint forms and put that in there just to kind of give it a more um, plain talk public view. So now that we've done all that, we've created a, we've optimized our search engine, we have a great website, how do we keep them there? Um, the next phase of this presentation, and something my colleagues will go more into, is keeping your audience once uh, you get them in. So just in general, our website is the one-stop shop for everything we do. Social media, strategic plans, patient-focused messaging, all of that can be found on our website. So just a real quick recap. Um, start off by building a brand that's unique. Give yourself a unique voice. Create some outcomes, align them with your communication strategy. Start collecting data, even if it's small, even if it's just a couple clicks a month. Kind of try and figure out where those people are going with. So then you can send messages that get read. The more you know about your audience, the more you can engage with them. The more channels you have, the more your engagement will increase. And so then engage, re-engage, set up ads on Google, uh, always change that algorithm so that you're using the most recent terminology. And then take this data, analyze, rinse, repeat, do it all over again. Um, and make sure you're using communication partnerships. We use DOH, medical associations, FSMB. You know, those partnerships are invaluable and they're really just one of the better ways to get um, up and running. So just a couple recommendations, um, highly I would highly recommend don't use social media for social media's sake. Use an editorial calendar where you can. You can schedule messages up to a year in advance. 
and they will automatically go into the system. So befriend automation, it is your friend. Um, and then make sure you're cutting through the clutter with multiple email lists, know who your audience is, and really target them. So then I'm going to turn the, turn the next part of our presentation over to Jerrica. This is me, stay connected, keep in touch. That may be important to be able to progress to the next slide. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jerrica. Often people see Jerrica or Jessica, but it is Jerrica, I assure you. Um, I am here today really to tell you about the strategies that Ohio has used in communicating with licensees. So, you know, I appreciate Jimmy. Thank you for leading the way. Here's what we do in Ohio. I look forward to talking about it. I like to start by saying this. I think this is different than a lot of the other boards. Um, we regulate more than 93,000 licensees. And you can see we have more than just allopathic and osteopathic physicians under our jurisdiction. So it's a wide range of licensee types and professions, and it gives the board really a very good perspective, right? When they're making policies and rules, there's a lot to consider. And of course for us then, as a communications department, there's a lot for us to consider, and we have to make sure that we tailor our messages accordingly. So I'd say our four primary uh, modes of communication or channels are what's on this screen. First, we have monthly communication. So we use an e-newsletter, um, both for our, again, all of our licensees, that 93,000 folks you saw on that last screen, as well as our um, physicians that have a certificate to recommend medical marijuana, they also get a monthly newsletter. And so the, the goal of the, the newsletter, what we include in there, is anything that's an update, anything that would be helpful for them to know. So that's legislative changes that will affect their license or practice, rule changes. Um, we have things, if we're looking for additional members for a committee or a council, or if we need to have consistent reminders about when to sign death certificates, or anything else that's, you know, that's helpful and that's new within that last month, we want to include that in the, the newsletter. Um, we also, of course, use our website. Our website is our hub for communication. And we have a news section on the website that basically, you know, you add the latest information. It's kind of like a timeline on a Facebook. So, you know, the, the most recent thing is at the top. And as you add additional messages, you know, they go down accordingly. But again, it helps licensees to see immediately when they come to our website what's, what's happening, what's the, newest, the latest news or the most important information. Um, targeted e-blasts. So, we have our monthly communications, but also, as you all know, a lot of things happen in between those monthly board meetings. So when there are things that are new, that are changing, um, an example of this is the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. So we have a 35th state that entered into the compact. There are a lot of questions and a lot of um, information that we have to be able to share with our licensees as this date in September approaches for us for implementation. So that's something where we can drill down to just those licensees that it affects, the MDs and DOs, and send out communications that are specific to them, as well as surveys. There are oftentimes we send surveys um, to gain information about specific topics so that we know how to move forward. Um, I would like to brag for just one minute. If you Google or look up, you know, the statistics on the open rate for emails, typically it's, I've seen, you know, between 17 and 28 percent. I've seen some varying numbers. I'm going to brag. You know, I went back to look and see even just from December on because we've had quite a few messages that have gone out, and we've had about 46 percent on average. So, I, I thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> what I'd like to attribute that to is that we try very hard, one, again, to have those relevant messages. People rely on the e-news. They know what's coming every month. They know after the board meeting, look out for it because it's going to hit our inbox. Um, we allow also other individuals, not necessarily just our licensees, to sign up for it. So maybe there's, you know, um, an office manager or a nurse practitioner or an MA or someone else who helps to you know, handle the information, they can sign up as well. They can get those updates so that they're informed. So we try to make it concise and readily available. Um, and then of course, one of, our, one of my favorite things, right, is education and outreach, just like this. Um, the board likes to take opportunities to get out into the, the public, to get out into the community. You know, we have a lot of partners between the associations, um, you know, some of the healthcare systems. And so we use those opportunities when they have conferences um, or events, tabling events, we go. You know, we've been at orientations for residents and fellows just to be able to share information that people need to know. 
it's a good opportunity for us when there's important updates in particular. It's something that is helpful for us to do. And again, I enjoy it. I think it's fun. I'm a people person. Can you tell? Um, social media. So I will admit, our numbers look meager. But I promise, we are increasing slowly but steadily. And we use social media just to augment the messages that we are already giving out, right? So. It's not like there, there are some reminders of things, but also it's just replicating the things that we put in e-news. So, hey, today's the, the medical board meeting. It's starting right now. Join our YouTube link live, right? Not live. Watch the YouTube link that is live. Um, or, hey, we just sent the e-news out. Make sure you catch a copy of it. Here's where you find access to it. So we are really, again, using it as another way to amplify the messages that we already send out. And we'll talk about YouTube because we're really pursuing the option of videos um, more aggressively and more often. I think it's a good medium for us. Um, I feel like you can't talk about communications without discussing how COVID interrupted everything, including how processes were done and how often we communicated with our licensees. So again, we had monthly newsletters, we had a website, we were moving right along, and then, oh no, we're getting messages from our governor's office and the Department of Health and the CDC, and every day we're getting five different emails and updates and changes, right? Everyone knows what that was like, we all lived through it. And so we had to figure out a new rhythm for how we communicated with licensees in this unique and specific situation. So I think there are a couple ways we did that. The main way is that, yep, we continue to use eBlast to be able to communicate, but we also created a designated page specifically for COVID-19 resources, and we put it smack dab in the middle of the website. You couldn't avoid it. If you scroll down, it was this big block that just said COVID-19, you know, so you could go there and look. And that page I took a little screenshot. You can see it on the screen. It had all the stuff that people were looking for. So those updates we were getting from the Department of Health, from our other you know, agencies and resources, we were sending emails out, and then we'd take that, make it into a PDF, put it right on that page, and put the date. So that, again, in real time, they could see, here's what this update was today. Oh, but two days from now, it changed. We can go back and reference what that old you know, message was, but still see what the newest information is available. We also put some additional resources on that page. Um, there were licensees, who, or I should say, there were professionals who were coming back into practice from retirement to help with the efforts, right? So we had some information for them. There was wellness resources because we all know how important that is and how burnout is a significant issue and we wanted to make sure that there are resources available from you know, the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, from our, uh, HP, or I'm sorry, our PHP, um, and from other agencies and entities that could just provide some um, alleviation. And then also telehealth because, of course, that was also a very important and um, interesting change. So we wanted to make sure people had one place to go, a centralized location where they could get their questions answered and addressed. Another thing we found, I think before this, but COVID just amplified this, is that the frontline staff inform our messaging. And what I mean by that is that the emails that we get, the calls that we get, and we have you know, a variety of inboxes, the contact inbox for general, a licensure team, right? Comms has an inbox, complaints has an inbox. When we start to see those same questions over and over again, whether it's about a rule that has come out or about um, a policy or something of that nature, right? It helps us and it informs the way that we communicate because we realize this is a bigger issue than we thought. Someone needs clarity, not just someone. A lot of people need clarity. So it really has um, helped us in terms of creating additional ways to communicate. And that has led in many ways to, again, non-traditional ways of doing things. So FAQs. You guys know what FAQs are. We started creating quite a few FAQs, and they were coming up for specific topics. Telehealth, right? Telehealth was changing and evolving, and here we are every day getting calls and emails. And we said, we can, we can put some language around this. We can point our licensees to what's in the current um, statute and what's in the rules and what's about to come and give them some clarity around this and help them to understand what, what the standard of care is surrounding this. Um, Light-based medical devices is another one for us. The use of lasers or laser hair removal. There were some law changes that happened um, that we needed to clarify. So that's been a great tool for us. And then also, okay, I thought that was me. Sorry. Um, and then also um, position statements. So we know that medical boards don't always like to take strong positions on things, but there are times where it's been very helpful. In particular, um, 
perhaps there's not a rule change, but again, there's a topic or a concept that is not quite clearly understood. The board has found that it's helpful in some of those scenarios to have a position statement, make it available, and we can refer people back directly to that documents on our website. Um, an example of this, it's too small for me to read there, but the one that I know that I worked on um, with our medical marijuana program, you know, we helped to approve qual additional qualifying conditions. And there are a couple of conditions that our board decided, you know, we don't need to approve these as new, petition or new conditions, but we have a condition that already exists, right? It, it, they fall into this condition. So we don't, we're not changing anything, we're not creating any new rules, but we're clarifying. So this position statement, you know, came to be. So again, they've just been kind of non-traditional, um, helpful tools for us as we help to communicate with our licensees and the public. Of course, and I know Jimmy mentioned this as well, strategic relationships are essential. Um, you know, those are just a, a few, really, of the connections and relationships we have built um, in Ohio and even nationally. Um, and so I know that we rely on these relationships. We have a director of legislative affairs who meets on a regular basis, I believe it's monthly, with um, many of the associations. Again, hearing updates, because honestly, some of that is just being able to hear, hearing from people and understanding what's happening and making sure the associations know what they're listened to and what concerns are being brought to them is very helpful. Um, I know also as we were creating this telehealth rules, which we're still in the process of doing, I believe we met with over 20 different entities, right, health care systems and associations just to hear what is important to physicians in this process. So it's something that we will continue to do and have um, really, I think, gained a lot from. And of course, we talked about YouTube a little bit earlier. Um, we have kind of made a little bit shift into using videos, and I'm excited about it because I think, you know, we send out, we have, we have the communications that are expected, we have the e-news, we have the website, but sometimes you just don't want to read. We know that, right? Sometimes I don't want to read things, and it can be, you know, if you look at a block of text, you might just be a little discouraged and keep on moving. But if we can send out a video that communicates the same thing, make it concise, make it straight to the point, and educate you about something that you need to know as a licensee of the medical board, then it's a helpful tool for us. So we are going to take a look at um, kind of, I've mashed up a couple of the videos that we've worked on just to give you an idea of what we're doing. Hold on, there's no sound. Technical difficulties. <laughs> you want to Cultural confidence is a commitment, first and foremost. It really focuses in on the individual. And it really just says that as a person, you're gonna to commit to being equitable, being fair, having humility when you're interacting with folks who maybe are from a different background than you are. Physicians are humans, and it's hard for us to believe or accept one of our peers would participate in misconduct. 
We also believe that someone else will report the misconduct, such as a department chairperson or a medical leader. Therefore, it is in our responsibility. Unfortunately, there has been a culture of silence in medicine concerning misconduct, but thankfully that is changing. We have to be careful when we identify someone that we think ahead of time. What will we do in our situation, in our own clinic, in our own emergency departments, wherever we practice, that we have a plan in place so that when we identify someone, we can make the right phone call to the right people who can respond as quickly as possible and keep this person safe. Okay, so that was just a little again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. A little taste of the videos that we um, have worked on, right? And again, I think the placement of them are um, is a helpful thing to, to consider when you're wanting to make sure that they're reaching as many licensees as possible. And I'll put in a shameless plug, we are also um, really looking to start um, being more visible to the public as well. And so we've started a YouTube series called Get to Know SMBO. Kind of catchy, right? Get to know SMBO um, as a way to educate the public on who we are and what we do. And so a video is another um, tool that we are using to communicate that information. So one of the clips you probably noticed is um, duty to report. That was one of our board members, Dr. Sherry Johnson. She's in, um, an OB in, I believe it's Cincinnati area, or Dayton area. And um, duty to report, of course, is a very significant topic. Um, you heard about it probably today. We have a sexual misconduct poster downstairs and um, it's one of those things that the board wants to make sure that we are reinforcing with their licensees. So you know we have spent the last couple of years reviewing policies and procedures and rules that are in place and how they have served us right and one of the things that was recommended to us um, kind of in an audit process was to strengthen our duty to report um, communication and again reinforce making sure that licensees know what is expected of them um, and so one of the ways this happened I should say licensees duties report technically is right there's statutory and ethical um, duties report violations of law rule and code of ethics standards to the medical board now that's something that we found is not widely understood we found that oftentimes providers know maybe they're going to talk about it maybe they won't um, they'll talk to maybe a supervisor a medical director maybe hr you know i guess even law enforcement potentially which again if a crime has occurred absolutely contact law enforcement but the medical board is the entity that's supposed to be reported to when a licensee of the medical board is aware of a fellow colleague um, committing some kind of violation and being outside of compliance. Because really this comes down to it being a patient issue and we're here to protect the safety of the public. So one of the things that the board decided to do, they voted I believe unanimously um, to have a required one hour CME on the topic of duty to report. So for every renewal cycle, physicians will have to complete one hour of CME on this. And again, to accommodate that, you saw one of the little clips from it, we actually made our own course. It was wonderful. And we did it during COVID, so it was challenging, but it was rewarding. And um, that video then, because it was now going to become a requirement as of last May, we had to make sure what? that our licensees knew it was a requirement because it doesn't help anything if we say you have to do it and no one knows. So um, we had to spend a lot of time and really think through the process of how to communicate this important rule that was you know, adopted by the board. And again, something that can impact the lives of patients and of providers. So this is how we did that. One step, we required an attestation at the top of every single license, initial and renewal licenses. The very first thing at the top of that license when they go to apply is an attestation they have to check that says, yes, I understand, I have a duty to report. So right off the bat, right, you saying that you know what this is, we um, expect you to be accountable to that. We also, of course, distributed e-blasts. So we talked about e-blasts before. We 
um, spent a lot of time creating information and updates about this, letting our physicians know, because this was a requirement specifically for our MDs, DOs, and DPMs, and let them know this is what's coming. This is what this means. Here's you know, a link to our rule and what statutorily you are required to do. And again, how this impacts the public. So we wanted to make sure that that was very thoroughly communicated. We also shared updates with associations. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that any single message that goes out in an email, any kind of update like that, we also have our legislative director send that directly to her list of contacts at the associations. We want it to be completely saturated, right? So that you're not just getting it as the individual licensees, but the organizations and the entities that are responsible for these groups and that are memberships of. We want to make sure that they have the information because there will be questions and we want everyone to be on the same page. We also built a new um, duty to report page. And so that page, again, had an overview of what was required, links to information, links to sexual boundaries videos that we also created, and just additional information to support the process. Um, and because, again, we know that we are sending out a video that requires technology, we assumed there were going to be some questions. And so in preparation for that, we also created a technical support document that says, here are tips and tricks. This is how, right, you know, if you're running into some issues, you may consider using these um, troubleshooting options as well as an inbox because, again, we knew we were going to get questions, and it's okay, right? It's okay to get questions from things. So we, use, um, we created that inbox so that we could funnel all of the questions into one place and address the, the licensee's questions, you know, in um, a quick and time period. We also created an FAQ document. We talked about the necessity of that earlier. So again, it just addressed all of the questions, most of the questions folks had, um, and making sure that we were clearly explaining things. And this is something I, I'm not sure if other people have done. We made the decision to incorporate duty to report into every single presentation that the board does. And I mean every single. So I talk to medical students. I talk to them about this too. When we do remedial education with Case Western Reserve University, we talk about duty to report. When we go out anywhere or say anything, it is something that stands on our table or like for tabling events and that we are going to communicate about because we want to make sure everyone knows that's how important it is to us and to the safety of Ohio. Featured in our magazine, that's an important one too. And then also we created a confidential hotline. That was one of the recommendations as well we received. So of course, any complaint that's received by the medical board is confidential, and there are ways to do that. But we create an additional option for that. So a hotline may be more comfortable for some folks. And we wanted to make sure that that was available. So basically, we will continue to learn from the methods that we use. Um, I think we've had a lot of success. And making sure people are aware of the information. Again, our, our relationships have improved and strengthened. Um, when we get feedback, we know we're doing something right. I imagine everyone's not thrilled when you get a bunch of questions when you send something out, right? It's not exactly the most fun, but that tells you that they're reading it and that people need to know and they want to know what to do and how to be in compliance. Um, so we'll continue to implement things and um, you know, try out new options and definitely pursue video as an alternative source of communicating. And as I would say that our takeaways then, if I'm trying to give best practices to folks, um, is be consistent whenever platforms you're using. So again, we have an e-news, we have um, our website updates. We do things that people count on us doing on a regular basis. And also be, be consistent in the messaging. We duplicate that message across you know, most of our mediums, just so everyone is getting the same info or being directed back to our website so they know where to get that information. Um, I'd also allow opportunity for feedback. Again, I know, sometimes you can get overwhelmed when you open an email inbox and you're like, oh no, here we are, right? But that feedback really does inform you and it has helped, um, even, even with our staff. There have been staff that have given recommendations that we've been, been able to implement and to um, better serve our licensees. And then also, I'd say use your relationships. Again, they are important if you're forging them, and um, strengthening them can really only benefit you when you're trying to protect your state. That's all I have, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Jerrica. Carlos? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Villatoro. I'm from the Medical Board of California, 
so happy to be here. I'm glad that the uh, FSMB extended us this invitation. I mean, we are in such a great city. How many of you guys have been on Bourbon Street? Show of hands. That's quite a bit of you. Now, I went there yesterday. I didn't get to enjoy it as much as I wanted to because, of course, I had to speak today. But uh, tonight, tonight. Um, in the spirit of Jimmy's uh, presentation and knowing who your target audience is, by a show of hands, who is here from either a medical board, being a member, or part of a medical board staff, by a show of hands. Okay, so quite a bit of you. And who is here as an MD or an L or a OD? DO, excuse me. Okay, so that helps me craft my presentation. I'm here to, today to talk to you guys about some of the tips and best practices that we use in California. And I gotta say, it's so interesting to see all of the different techniques and the different ways of doing things in the other state because I'm learning from you guys. I'm learning how you guys do it so I can take it back to my board and say, hey, over, over in Washington they're doing this, over in Ohio they're doing this. And um, I, I just find that extremely beneficial. Like many of you, our mission in California is consumer protection. Now I have to underline this because a lot of people uh, especially in California, think that our mission is doctor protection. But that's not true. It is consumer protection. So one of the ways that we achieve this mission is, of course, by licensing physicians. A lot of people forget that that is a, an important aspect of consumer protection. We're not going to give a license to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And if you are giving a license to somebody who doesn't deserve it, then stop. Don't do that no more. Um, another way that we meet this mission is, of course, enforcement of what is known in California as the Medical Practice Act. It's a series of laws that govern the practice of medicine, uh, where they meet in the middle, of course, and if you guys are old enough to get that, that picture, you guys are, are my people, um, is communication, and that's what we're here about. So this is just a quick snapshot of uh, our board makeup. We have 15 board members, 13 are appointed by our great governor, Governor Gavin Newsom, you guys might know him. Uh, one is appointed by the Senate Pro Tem and one is appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly. On our board there are, it is composed of eight physicians and seven public members. Currently, I've. I need to change that because while I was here, there were two members appointed. Uh, so there are currently 13 seated board members, seven are physician members, and six are public members. So as a fun fact, there is a bill moving through the state legislature that will make our board a public member majority. I don't know if you guys are public member majorities here. No? Okay. And we license uh, quite, a, quite a bit of physicians. We license only allopathic physicians. Uh, the osteopathic physicians are licensed by the Osteopathic Medical Board of California. So it's, it's very different. But they, they usually just follow what, what we do, I'm told. Uh, we license midwives, research psychoanalysts, polysomnographic trainees. Those are the people who do conduct the sleep studies. You guys know who that is? Uh, I didn't know. That's what I'm telling you. But um, those are our fast facts. Okay, so tip one, okay, is to know your toolkit. This is what our toolkit looks like in California. Uh, we have an iOS app for Apple. I'm going to talk to you guys about that later. We have a call center staffed by live people that licensees can call in, check the status of their license, and they can talk to a live person. It's staffed Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and that's, that's a bonus. We also have an email catch-all where we communicate with our licensees. Uh, website, of course, social media. We're on Facebook, 
Twitter, and YouTube, with Twitter being the big um, social media presence. We do podcasting, we do videos, and we have a newsletter that we use to communicate. So we are well aware of our tools and that helps us in communicating with our licensees and it helps us deliver the messages. So you guys as medical board communicators are gonna wanna take an inventory of your tools. What tools do you currently have in your communication toolkit? Do you have social media? Do you have a newsletter? Do you have, uh, I think it's in Washington where they do Facebook live streams and that's innovative stuff. I, I like hearing that. Um, what tools have been most effective in getting your message across? What tools would you like to have? What are the challenges in obtaining those tools? A tip for you guys is to seek, and, and I know that a lot of you guys come from medical boards that are smaller. In California, the communications team for the Medical Board of California consists of myself and two others. I have one, uh, one employee who does Public Records Act requests, and I have another one who is our newsletter designer. As far as media relations, social media, press releases, and that kind of thing, that's, that all falls on me to do. My advice for the smaller boards out there that maybe you only have one person doing everything is to seek people within your agency who have the skill sets but have not been given the opportunity to use them. You never know who in your, who in your, in your office can do social media, who can do podcasting. It's, it's good to know who is in your office that can do these things. And I know it's, it's, it's a bummer when you have to, you know, pile on work to your other staff members. I mean, nobody wants to, to have other work piled on, but it gives them an opportunity to flex those, those muscles, those creative muscles and helping you guys communicate with your licensees. It's a good resume builder too. So there are ways that you can sell it to the person you're trying to recruit. Tip two is to keep it simple. Look at them. They are so confused. I don't blame them. I mean, it's our fault. As communicators, it is our fault. Now, doctors speak their own language. When you mix the language with legal language, which is kind of like the strange marriage that medical boards often deal with, I know it was surely a learning curve for me when I first started, um, it's imperative that you keep your language simple. So your messages should be written in plain language, uh, language that anyone can understand. Physicians are busy people and they don't have time to decipher business and professions codes. They don't have time to decipher what the law means for them. They just wanna know how not to get in trouble with the board. And that's what you guys as communicators have to, have to communicate. Messages should be complete and contain all the relevant information. Think about, who, think about the message from the reader's perspective. What would they like to know? What information would they want? If you were a doctor and if you were to get an email from the medical board, what would you like to know in the message? It has, it has to be complete and relevant to them. This is a no-brainer, but you would be surprised at how often this happens at our board. Messages should be free from errors, grammatical and factual. At our board, there are several, several layers of eyeballs that go out on our communications. And sure enough, sometimes we do not catch them all. And quite frankly, it's embarrassing when that happens. So my advice to you is, Make sure that your messages are free from these kind of errors. Where do your messages tend to go unread? Keep it short and concise. Nothing is worse than opening up an email with a wall of text, guys. Nothing is worse. You guys are lucky if your readers will read the very first two paragraphs. If they read anything beyond that, well, consider yourselves rock stars when it comes to communication. Because 
and it's the same in the news business. I was a reporter for several years. And that's why in the news business, there's something called the nut graph. It's the graph that the story is about, and it typically appears in either the second paragraph or the third. So this is the message that is the nut. You want to eat the nut and throw away the shell. Think of that. Message frequency is also a factor. My colleagues have spoken about that, and I echo their th thoughts and sentiments. The more messages you send, the more it becomes white noise, especially email blasts. Tip three is forge partnerships, like the FSMB here. Here are some of our partnerships that we formed, and they consist of all different kinds of state agencies, uh, consumer agencies, the FSMB, um, the ACCME, which I'm going to talk to you guys about now. We partnered recently with the ACCME, which is the Accreditation Council for CME. What we did with them is they have a system called uh, PARS, and it's a system that licensees can use to report their CME credit. It allows the CME providers to report physician participation in accredited CME directly to the board. So this is an initiative that gives us instant access to CME. No longer do we, uh, do we uh, require, although in some cases when we're doing audits, they still have to send them to us. But we have easier access now to look up licensees CME, which is a big deal. Because staff can now access their program, and it's called the a program and activity reporting system to gain instant access to the CME. It's short as PARS, P-A-R-S. The benefits to this include the removal of a paper-based system. If in California, you guys know, everything is green in California, or so our governor wants us to be. Um, and so this is our way of going green. Uh, paper-based systems, no, no. Green-based systems, yes, yes. Process efficiency, you can't beat it. I mean, you, you, you look up the CME online and, and it's a done deal. No more waiting for the snail mail. Uh, and it's the cost savings for the board. Some benefits to creating partnerships include forging partnerships helps circulate your messages further. It goes both ways. So if you have a special communication that needs to go out, well, Hit up your partners. Your partners will help you spread that message, either with social media or their listservs or however else they communicate. It's very, very beneficial for both sides. Partners can provide relevant content and lighten your workload. I can't tell you guys how many times we have had a white space in our newsletter and have to, okay, what else, what else can I throw in there? I want to throw in something relevant, but I'm not just going to make something up. Well, here's something that the California Department of Health put out on a fentanyl or on the rise of congenital syphilis among Latino mothers. Well, by golly, there's my white space filler, but I wouldn't know about it if I didn't have that partnership. So it, it can lighten your workload, and that's what's not to love about that. Partnerships are critical in times of crisis and national emergencies. COVID-19... I'm sure you guys have worked with all, all different kinds of partners within your state to message uh, during COVID-19. And I can tell you that having the partnership and that structure in California helped us. It helped us a, a great deal. These type of partnerships should also happen in academia, trade groups, consumer groups, the media, and lawmakers. You want to get everybody on your side. So when it's time for you to ask for a law in front of the legislature, they'll like you. And maybe they might write that law that you're trying to get passed. Or maybe they won't. I mean, it all depends on how, how well your relationship is. But if there's no relationship there to begin with, then there's no foundation for that partnership. And it makes it easier for you guys to get what you want. This is a, a peculiar uh, bullet point, and it, it should happen within your own board. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is how many times have you guys come up to the situation where your licensing is doing something but doesn't tell anyone? Or your enforcement is doing a, a, a big enforcement action against a physician, high profile. We're talking the George Tyndalls 
of, of, of your state. And if you guys don't know who George Tyndall is, he was a very, very bad man. But nobody's talking to each other. And that happens at boards more often than you know is that the communication is lacking. You know, there have been times in California where we've issued an advisory on a new law to someone. Next thing you know, our consumer information unit is going, why are we getting all these calls? Oh, sorry. Uh, we forgot to tell you that. Don't let that happen. Do not let that happen. Luckily, it doesn't happen anymore in California because we learned our lesson the hard way. Tip four is to be relevant. I have two more tips, guys. Bear with me. Uh, yeah, opioid epidemic, new laws, COVID-19, got to be relevant to your audience. Physicians normally want three types of information. They want to know issues affecting their licenses, okay? They're busy people. They want to know what's happening to their license, what is happening to their renewal. They want to know what is the holdup in getting their renewal or their licensure. They want information pertaining to that. They also want to know about laws. They want to know how not to get in trouble with the board. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like a no-brainer. Everybody want, nobody wants to be in trouble with the board. So how, how do I get that information? Uh, they also want information providing guidance on a variety of issues like opioids or COVID-19 and scope of practice. I can't tell you how many times we, we get questions about medical assistance and their scope of practice. Can my medical assistant do surgery? Can my medical assistant uh, take out a liver out? You know, I trained them. I trained them. Well, it's, it's your license if they do. I'll tell you that much. You want to throw it away for a medical assistant? Go right ahead. But don't expect to be practicing anymore in California. Oh, brother, okay. Boost your relevancy and usefulness by identifying your target audience. Again, props to Jimmy for uh, giving us that. Identifying one or two main takeaways you would like your audience to walk away with. Quite frankly, if you give them more, they're going to forget it. You don't want them to forget it, guys. Decide how your messages, decide how the messages will be delivered. Will it be on social media? Will it be on a newsletter blast? Will it be on your website? Will it be all of the above? Only you guys can decide how your messages will be delivered. Plan your messages in advance so that time-sensitive requirements or calls to action don't expire. What do I mean by that? I mean, if there is a requirement that is adopted in your state that requires all physicians to report an email address to your board, by the beginning of the fiscal year. Well, guys, don't wait until the day before to send an email out. Do it months in advance. Start your messaging months in advance. Otherwise, oh, you're going to get a lot of calls and uh, angry people on your phone. Provide timely updates as needed. Don't just put information out there and not go back to it if it needs updating. Update that information. Especially when there have been amendments to the different laws and regulations. Always update the information. Don't just assume that the, the physicians are going to go back to it just because they have such a big interest in that kind of stuff. No, they just want to know how to not get in trouble, and that's part of it. Some things to avoid. Messages that have nothing to do with your duty. I can't tell you how many times the board in California gets hit up by a pharmaceutical company asking them to advertise in our newsletter for their latest and greatest wonder drug. We're not in the business of advertising wonder drugs. We are in the business of consumer protection. Messages with errors, punctuation, punctuations or facts. Again, I'm not going to go over that again because I, you know, I just did. Neglecting the consideration of your reader. Doctors are busy people. They want to know the information and they want it fast. Craft your messages accordingly. The overuse of email blasts, again, it becomes white noise after a while, so use those sparingly. Instead, go to your social media, go to your newsletter, uh, go to your website for those kind of messages. Use those only for the critical stuff. And I can't tell you 
what, how to define the critical stuff because only you guys know that. Writing messages in legal ease or with too much jargon. Again, nobody likes legalese. Nobody likes doctor speak. Everybody likes plain language that just gives you the meat and potatoes of what is going on, what the message is. Tip five, one more after this, is to leverage technology. Here are some of our technology. Uh, there's Sean Acklekraut, who is our IT manager. He's recording a podcast. We have a docs portal that is used for colleges in California to submit uh, primary source documents. And here we are meeting uh, via WebEx, our board meeting. So we're leveraging that technology in California to help us with our mission. Be selective about the type of technology you use. Keep your target audience in mind and create buy-in. There's no wrong way to deliver your content as long as you're doing it consistent. So you don't have a Facebook page. You don't have a Twitter page. You want to start getting uh, on those social media uh, platforms, but you're intimidated. You're scared. You don't know how to tweet. You don't know anything about Instagram. You don't know, you know how to do a, a GIF or a GIF. But don't let that stop you. Just do it. Get out there. If you make mistakes, you, you make mistakes, but you're going to learn from your mistakes and you're going to get better. Don't let that become a barrier for you. Just be consistent. Shake things up at your board. Just because it's never been done at your board doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a mentality that gets on boards uh, that happens at boards. It's like, well, we, we've never done this before. So what? Do it. Get out there. Be brave. Break, break, the, break the cycle. Break the mold. Get out there and communicate. Open a Snapchat. Op open an Instagram. You know, get out there and, and make it happen. And that, you know, that can be hard. You got to create buy-in. You got to show why your board, how your board will benefit that, and more importantly, how consumers as well as licensees will benefit from it. The content is king. I'm sure you guys have, have heard this before as communicators, but so is access to it. So keep that in mind. If you can't access the message, then what good is the message? Tip six, make allies of the media, as, as this gentleman has, has done. This is important, guys. And yes, I know this is all your inner child doesn't want to make friends with the media, but, but you have to. You have to, guys. It's critical. The media can be a powerful ally in helping you spread your message to the masses. Building a relationship with the media increases the likelihood of fair treatment in stories. And I can tell you the media in California is brutal. They are brutal. But we have a good relationship with them. And any time that we want fair treatment, they give it to us. Well, not every time. I'm not going to lie to you guys. But um, for the most part, they have been fair to us. The added benefit of informing the public and other stakeholders besides licensees, nothing spreads the word like a good news story or a bad one. Keep that in mind. It can make correcting factual errors and stories much easier. So how do you get good with the media? How do you get good with the media? That's a great question. Identify a point person at your board, somebody that the media can go to each and every single time that they have a question. It helps to have that familiarity with uh, your board and the media. Be overly responsive and transparent. If you are not going to be able to meet the deadline of whoever is contacting you, well, tell them. Send them an email. Be courteous, be professional, let them know that you are working on it. And more often than not, they will be appreciative of that and it will create a good rapport. Respect their deadlines. Ooh, that's another, that's another big one. You always want to respect their deadlines because if you make them miss their deadlines, it's going to appear, it's not going to appear in the best light for you or your board. Message them when you have news to share and you want it publicly known. 
a.k.a. give them tips. Throw them a bone once in a while. Of course, it's not going to be a bone that's going to harm you in the long run. Maybe you have a new Twitter site or a new website redesign. Throw, throw them a bone. They'll like you more. Again, correct factual and grammatical errors I know. Maybe that's going to be the takeaway is always make sure that your presentations are, are, are free of errors and free of uh, factual grammatical errors. Be consistent with your messaging. That's, an, that's another big one because if you have, for example, the New York Times calling you, don't get starstruck that the New York Times is contacting your little board and give them the information. And then when the small hometown newspaper calls you, brush them off. Be consistent with your messaging across. And don't play favorites. It goes into that. Don't play favorites with the media. Always be consistent. Always give everyone the same information. If the New York Times gets an interview, well, by golly, the Desert Hill podunk newspaper gets one too. Now, I've been asked to talk about a success story about the app, and this was the only one that I can think of, so I'm, I'm kidding. But, um, our app is developed in-house by MBC staff. This is good because it doesn't cost us any money. It's just all folded into our uh, budget that we normally pay our folks. It uses existing technology built into our DCA search. This was important because it uses a technology called Prefetch to send you alerts to your phone. And it can't, you can't do it without our uh, existing database. It allows users to follow up to 16 licenses. So if you download the app, you can put the license of your children's physicians, your spouses, grandma, grandpa. And if, if there is an, uh, a change in that license, if they change their address or if their address expired or if they got in trouble, then it sends you an alert. That's, that's not an alert that you want to get, but hey, it does the heavy lifting for you, and that's, that's a huge benefit. So to message for this app, we comprised a plan, and the first one was to have the dang thing ready before, <laughs> before we issued all of our communication. So that was the hard part. We developed a series of promotional materials. We did videos, podcasts, flyers, you name it. Social media graphics, wet content. I wish I could show you the social media uh, posts that didn't make it because those were funny. Um, spread, you know, we wanted to spread the word. We did so through the press, a press conference. We did so through social media, newsletter, website, in-person outreach events. Those were all employed. These were some of the goods that we delivered. We did a, a video. You can see a newsletter article on the upper right hand. We got a skinny flyer and a regular flyer. We did the podcast. We had a whole web page underneath the goods. If you can see the license alert mobile app. Got a news release out and we just, we went full, full court press on this. And the outcome was a lot of positive coverage in these newspaper outlets. And I can tell you that nothing beats good coverage in a newspaper, so it's better than, it's way, way better than negative coverage, I'll tell you that much. And the outcome, so on day one of the, of the app launch, we had 2,280 downloads because of our efforts, and that was a big deal for us. To date, the app has 14.9 thousand downloads, and it's got a 3.8 rating out of five on the App Store. We're very excited about that. Uh, we're not just leaving this app in, in the dust, so we are continually working to improve it. And that is me. I think we'll take questions uh, now. Thank you, Carlos. So we now have a, a few minutes for some questions and comments. Um, if you do want to come forward and use these microphones, please just uh, uh, say your name and your affiliation with the board. Thanks. Fred, DC Board of Medicine. Um, so this is for Jimmy. So we have, we don't have someone, and 
in our office and we have a dearth of people who have experience with social media. Um, so we'd have to hire someone. What are the guidelines that you're giving people, because we're clearly going to be outsourcing this or bringing someone in to be posting on our social media and twi Twitter? If you can imagine in DC, like everybody has an opinion about everything. So as soon as the first post goes out, it'll be like a flood of criticism and we're fine with that. But what would we tell people to avoid? Like, of course, no disparaging comments by other physicians, but like, what are the guidelines for people? So are you, uh... okay, are you asking what you want to tell the person you're contracting your social media or what you, like your community yeah. guidelines for social media? No, no, clearly not that. We don't want to be that basic. Hopefully we're bringing someone who, in who has some experience with posting and okay. that kind of thing. But clearly there have to be guidelines on what they can post and what they can't, like what regulates what you post. Like we have enough content because there's sure. always something going on, right? right. But we want to make sure we don't get into muddy waters. So what do you avoid posting about? So I would, and I think everyone up here will have a little, will have a piece of advice for you, but um, I think one of the biggest things you can do is just decide what you want your voice to be. Um, do you, are you going to kind of, tar are you going to target a younger generation that tends to like their social media to be a little more engaging and cheeky? Um, Facebook Live videos, 87% of people prefer Facebook Live because of a, um, almost a grittier feel. It makes you feel like a, a real, you know, live boy. Um, so if, do you want to go on that scale or do you want to go on that end of the spectrum or do you want to just basically be the nuts and bolts, here's the information you need. So I think in terms of telling that person or creating that guideline, decide who you want to be on social media. Do you want to be informal or do you want to be formal? And once you decide where you want to land on that spectrum, um, I would just say social media is one of the few places where we don't get fatigued. Um, unlike email blasts and things of that nature, having uh, your inbox constantly loaded with messages from the medical board might get tiring. I personally don't think you can put too much on social media. We have an editorial calendar. We try and plan it at least a month in advance, and it will automatically send out those messages based on, is it Public Safety Awareness Day? Is it Eat a Taco Day? And we're going to say something about that. Um, kind of plan, plan at least a month in advance. Talk to your staff about anything they might have going on. I talk to my licensing manager and say, how backed up are we? Can we put out a message saying, Get those applications in early because if you don't, we're talking six weeks now. Um, so my advice would, my initial guideline would be decide you wanna go formal, informal, plan out messages um, as far ahead as you can, befriend automation in that. Um, and I mean, one a day is not unheard of in terms of just getting information out. You, uh, people tend to not get fatigued on social media. I mean, how many people looked at their, their Facebook or Twitter at least once during this presentation? You're not going to hurt my feelings. I know you did. I saw you on your phones. Uh, you know, we just, we like picking it up and going, has the world ended? Nope. Okay. What were, what were they talking about? So I, um, I think, you know, you can't fatigue. Go big. Be bold. <laughs> and decide if you want to be formal or informal. I don't know if you guys have any other advice. Uh, I, know. I, I think I hear your question as how do you start and how do you not um, anger people? That, that's what I heard from your question. I think uh, we actually had a PIO um, who recently left the board and so I'm, she primarily did the, commun the um, social media handling and so I've absorbed that until we hire someone else. But I think what I've used as my, um, guiding star is one what is our mission so our mission is protecting the public I'm going to use anything that helps to support that mission so I am oftentimes retweeting messages from our fellow state agencies right today is um, you know infant mortality awareness day that's something that absolutely people need to know about these are you know things that I can use to collaborate with the other associations or agencies as well as um, like you said if there's an opportunity for something fun and lighthearted like there was national superhero day I believe yesterday I did schedule the tweets for the week because I knew I was going to be here and that that's a great opportunity for me to say 
um, we, we celebrate our superheroes, which are our, our licensees and medical practitioners. So in, uh, the way that I see it um, is that anything that's going to help support your message that will help encourage individuals, and also if it's practical, because we also put up our newsletter is online, our a board meeting has started, you know what I mean? So bouncing back between those kinds of messages and for me has been helpful um, to fill the space on our Twitter page in particular and also not take anybody off, so. Carl, do you want to respond to that? Oh, um, I just, I echo uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, in California, <clears throat> we tend to take a more bureaucratic approach towards our messages. And so far, it's worked for us. Uh, so retweets and reposts from fellow state agencies, uh, you know, the Department of Consumer Affairs, those type of entities, they're all safe. Uh, one thing that you don't, that you want to avoid when you're doing social media is engaging with the trolls because they will come out. You just have to be really careful as to how you engage with them. Another thing is if somebody on social media is disclosing information or complaining about a doctor or you know, sends you an angry message about what's going on with my, with my case. I filed a, a complaint and now you guys are stonewalling me or you don't wanna get in that kind of engagement. You always just wanna keep it professional and you know, Thank you for contacting us. Please, you know, we're very concerned about this issue. Please reach out to us uh, either by phone or email at this, this number. So you just have to be mindful of, of, of that kind of thing. I would start small. <laughs> I would start very, you know, small and consistent. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Jose Letape. I'm from South Africa. Uh, my question is about the choice of language and the image of the state board, whether we want to be seen as part of the police force or as friends of practitioners. For example, when we talk about a duty to report, it's more like an ethical duty to be a snitch. Uh, is there a different language that could be used that is more acceptable in the medical profession, like duty to notify or to share? Because part of the problem that we have, we have this image where we, we like part of the vigilantes and the profession doesn't see us as a friend to them, even though we say we're protecting the public. So I just want you to comment about the issue of how we communicate and the language that you use and whether we see ourselves as part of the establishment in terms of legalese, policing, or as a friend to the practitioner guiding them and whether the choice of language might be enabling if we spoke about duty to share or duty to notify. I mean, when we st talk about infectious diseases back home, we noti they are notifiable illnesses. They are not illnesses to be reported. Just a question. Um, I mean, I guess. I, um, yeah, go ahead. No, we had the duty to report information. So I, I think that's a... Um, I think it's an interesting point. Language does matter clearly, and how how a message like that's perceived is important. I think um, what we have spent a lot of time doing thus far is making sure that the why behind the duty to report has been communicated and and what that really entails. Because you know I've been to exhibiting events where someone says duty to report, right? Ah. I'm not doing that. You may, you know, you want us to snitch on people, and you know that I understand that can be a sentiment, I suppose. But our goal really is to, I think, better paint the picture that we're saying that you you have a you hold a lot of clout, and that you have a, a significant and enormous responsibility as a licensed practitioner in Ohio, and that we applaud you for that and are grateful for all what that you do, but also we expect something out of you to some degree, right? But that responsibility um, is important. And in particular, particular, always coming back to why we are doing this, which is making sure that patients are not put at risk just because um, something was overlooked or, you know, more, more egregiously, something was 
purposely overlooked or neglected. So I think I think the point about the language that we use is important, um, and I think we'll continue to you know look for ways to better explain and expound on the whys and the hows. Um, this information, or I should say, the, the whys and the hows. This is important. Uh, thank you for that question. I think it's a great question because you, you, you are right. I mean, how do you communicate to a population that sees you as the police, you know, that, that sees you as somebody who, who wants to get them, right? Um, we're, we're in a very, very specific field, and that's the regulation of, of medicine. So one of the ways that we kind of help bridge that gap is to get them at the med medical school level somewhere where they are learning the ins and outs and the nuts and bolts of the practice of medicine. So we will do presentations at these medical schools to, to kind of get them when they're early and to, and to fold some of the messaging that we need for them to know for when eventually they do get their licenses. We're, what we're doing is we're planting seeds. You know, we're, we're giving them the information that they're going to need, for example, and, and it could be about anything, about the duty to report the Hippocratic Oath, um, it could be about anything that you want it to be, but get them early, get them at the medical school level, and you know, you, that way you can start building a relationship with them so that you know, they don't see you as an enemy, that they, you are giving them information that they are going to need when they get licensure. That's how you forge a partnership with, with them. So I, yeah, that's, that would be my recommendation is to, is to Start doing a little bit of outreach to the medical schools in your area and see if you know, they will let you present to, to their students. We are right at time, so thank you so much for joining us. Let's give a round of applause to the panelists.